welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we speak with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we are joined by Z Spencer, a software developer and member slash owner of two worker cooperatives, Cohere and Zinc Collective, based out of Oakland, California. Z Spencer, welcome to Maintainable. Oh, hey, Robbie. Thanks for having me on. So, really hard-hitting question. What do you believe are a few common characteristics of, dare I say, maintainable software code? I think the common characteristic is approaching the software as a social system, as opposed to a purely technological system. Factoring in things like, what do people have this time and attention to work on? And what skills did the team already have in existence? And what is the parts of the application that are making things better for the users and the customers? And what are the things in the application that maybe are not? And just kind of like approaching it less as a ideological, functional programming, good, object-oriented, bad, procedural, even worse kind of mindset. You wind up with software that is more maintainable because it is more holistically thought through, in my opinion. Interesting. And a number of the folks that I've definitely talked to about this on the podcast have kind of touched on some of the patterns they've seen as far as how, like, what are some good practices that a team might follow to continue to be able to maintain software? So maybe thinking about your, as you said, like social system, if you were to come into a, an existing application that's been around for, let's say, five years, what sort of things would you look for or need to know of the team and or of the software to kind of go, okay, this seems like it's being moderately well taken care of and, and looks like something that we can continue to evolve? I would look for pressure. Any system that is under pressure is a system that is unlikely to be maintainable. If the system is constantly under aggressive goals for how it must change or aggressive goals for, you know, it basically existential threats, all of those things result in software being very difficult to maintain. So if you see people who are constantly firefighting or sprinting and sprinting and sprinting and never taking a moment to breathe, or like talk through things or explore the problem at a higher level, you wind up with software that just people just keep tacking on stuff to, and they tack on a new thing and they tack on a new thing, and they never take the time to actually sit back and remove the parts that aren't creating value anymore. You know, the features that maybe don't get used very often, but still have bugs in them. Maybe there was some infrastructure code that you wrote, you know, three years ago, but it's not necessary to have that anymore because Heroku just upgraded their Redis installation and now you can use managed Redis instead of the Heroku at Redis, right? So like a lot of it is just like having space and spaciousness to to assess the things that are adding to your, your software's carry cost and then adjust it. And I know that's not really the answer you're looking for because <laughs> you want me to like point out, oh yes, they had feature tests, fuck yes. But like... It is really about spaciousness and bringing a sense of spaciousness to the software itself. And if you don't have that, then it doesn't matter how great of a unit testing framework you have or, you know, how accurately your type system reflects the mental model of the users and the, and the organization at large, you're still going to run into systems that just tip over and you can't change. Right. And I think a number of things you're kind of outlining here. If people on a team have the mental bandwidth to think about and reflect on what is and what isn't worth keeping around anymore, what things might be need to be modified or you know removed, or just thinking of like, oh, maybe we could do some optimization if we take advantage of something else that say Heroku or, our, or wherever our, we're hosting our applications are at, can reduce some of the configuration, the stuff that we're doing, like that stuff that you have to maintain one way or another. You're describing a lot of the underlying problems that tend to be what I've noticed from a lot of people's use maybe as the typical types of reasons why they're not doing those other technical things. So I think it's a great answer. I think that you're kind of speaking to 
well, why didn't she go back and do this? Like, well, I didn't have any fucking time to do that. You know, it wasn't, there was no time to do that. Like the pressure was to focus on these other things. We're shipping new features. We're, you know, whatever, insert startup excuse at that point in time. And those are all valid excuses too. Sometimes there's a lot of things that are at play and you don't know if you even have that time or not, or if it's even worth taking the time early on in that project, but some good points you're making there. So thinking about software code specifically for a little bit, how many hours in the sun do you think it takes for new code to turn into legacy code? So my perspective on legacy code is probably a little bit different than the rest of your your listener base. But legacy code is profitable code. And I operate multiple very small business models, like very small products that generate revenue, right? And for me, if the code that I write is not directly contributing to the revenue model for the business, it probably should be gone anyway. If it is contributing to the revenue model, then it is probably going to have constraints applied to it that maybe it wouldn't have if I was trying to approach it from a purely ideological programming perspective, right? So I might skip a few tests because like, it doesn't make sense to test this case because I don't expect it to happen. So like this morning, for instance, I was pairing with one of my co-op members and we were trying to figure out What should happen when someone's subscription, like we have this notion of sponsoring a subscription for the product, right? Like, hey, you know, I'm a family member and I'm going to pay for these four people and that makes total sense. But what happens if somebody decides that they want to pay for their own membership now? We went back and forth and we were like, well, let's just write a test case to see what happens now. Like this was literally code we wrote two weeks ago and it was already had reached a spot where it was in this moment, basically what most people would consider legacy code. It was code that would behave in a surprising way or where the system didn't clearly communicate what the intent behind the behavior should be. And I don't know if that's a really kind of the direction you're trying to go here, but it's like legacy code is immediate. Like there's no such thing as non-legacy code. If it's been written as part of your legacy, if you want to remove that part of your legacy, that's fine or change it. That's also fine. But there's nothing wrong with code that you're not happy with or code that isn't ideal. So maybe like 12 to 14 hours in the sun, then it becomes legacy or two weeks worth. I mean, I would, I would say like 20 minutes. If you're happy with the code that you wrote 20 minutes ago, then you probably weren't making enough trade-offs. You were probably working too much through your own self-interest and not enough through the, what is the sociological system at play and how can I best represent them? Even if it puts myself a little bit behind or puts myself ahead in some cases. Sure. So, okay. And so in all seriousness, so what would you say has been one of the most effective changes you've made over the years in your career as a software developer with how you communicate with clients about what it means to maintain their software? I communicate in terms of carry cost. If you've ever looked at a P&L, a profit and loss sheet for a business, there is your gross receipts. So the money that comes in, And there is, underneath of that, there's what's called your operating costs. And your operating costs are the costs that you just have because the software is running, right? So if you're running a software as a service business, your operating costs might be like your Amazon infrastructure bill and stuff like that. And time is also an operating cost, right? So every time a customer like tries to use a feature and they have to reach out to support, that's an operating cost, right? Like that is time and attention that that support person could have been using to do some customer development research or provide some QA feedback or stuff like that, right? So when I talk about maintaining software, it's always about how can we reduce carry costs? And if the answer to that is we don't need to, which is quite frequently the case, right? Like if you've got like $10 million in the bank, carry costs don't matter that much, right? You've got three years of runway and you've got enough customers and all those things. But if you are talking about like, oh crap, we're running low, we need to figure out how to make sure that we don't have to spend, we don't have to hire another team member or we don't have to, you know, spin up a second, you know, cluster of servers bringing us to like $300 a month instead of 150. Like it becomes more meaningful. So that's kind of the the shift I've taken. Like I don't really talk about, you know, test coverage anymore or like, oh, we need to do refactoring. It's like, oh, well, here's some, there's some pain that we're experiencing that is increasing our carry costs for working on this feature. I have to spend... 30 minutes fighting with this thing every time we deal with it. And I would like to pay down that carry cost. We can talk about that with non-programmers and they can be like, oh yeah, so if it's 30 minutes and we change this feature every week, mm, okay, that's, you know, two hours a month. That's a 
two times 12, 24 hours a year. Okay. So if you can, if you can solve it in four hours, I think that's a reasonable trade off. But otherwise, like we'd rather just pay that additional 20 hours a year in people time because it's actually cheaper for us to do that than to not. Right. But like, it can't just be because you're suffering, right? As, as a programmer, life is suffering. Like, that's what we do. We suffer so that others may not have to. That's kind of my entire shift that I've made over the last couple of years is just to switch to that kind of mental model. What percentage of time do you think developers should be focused on improving existing code versus building new features and adding new things to the code base? My client I work with on Wednesdays. The way we work is nine o'clock rolls around. We hop on Zoom. And we chat briefly, how are the kids, how are the dogs, the cats, how are they all getting along? You know, about five minutes or so of that. And then we start talking about the features we're trying to work on for the day and like, oh, what was hurting us last week and so on and so forth, or last time we were paired. And then we spend the next two hours just like cleaning up and improving the infrastructure stuff. So like upgrading from, they were on paperclip and now we're moving to active story. So like, that's a multi-week project at this pace. And we just spend like two hours a week on it. And then the other four hours of that day, we spend on, you know, feature enhancements and bug fixes. And that kind of a split has been really effective because this is a company that's been around for 30 years. They have one developer and they've been working really well for all that time, profitable, all those great, wonderful things. You know, making steady improvements in that context is totally reasonable. But I've also worked at companies where they've gone through six months trying to land this big client, right? Like they've started the project six months ago and they've thrown hundreds of thousands of lines of code at it. Like I once broke down the amount of code that was written and it was like three Harry Potter's books worth of code <laughs> in like a six month period. Oh wow! And that company now spends, I would say probably 80% of their time just trying to unbury what they did in that six month time period because they don't actually take a holistic approach to it, unfortunately. They just kind of just eat the cost and they just go really, really slow. So it's really dependent on the context. Personally, I think 20 to 30% of your time spent just like making your life suck a little bit less as a programmer is a pretty reasonable amount of time. More than that is probably an indication of an unhealthy context. And less than that is an indication that you're going to become an unhealthy context pretty quickly. You know, as you work with other developers and on different teams over the years, what are some things you've noticed that, in your opinion, developers sometimes get wrong when they talk about or label things as technical debt? I mean, you could go with the canonical answer of like, oh, it's not tested and therefore it's technical debt, right? Like you could go with, do you remember, I want to say his name was Israel. This was back maybe 10 years ago. He developed a product called Sonar, which was a plugin for one of the CI, I think maybe Jenkins, one of the Java ones, right? It would do a lot of really powerful static analysis and stuff. It was kind of like a precursor to code climate kind of thing, right? His perspective and a lot of the perspectives that were kind of prevalent was like, well, these objective quality metrics are the cause of technical debt or the lack of coverage is the cause of technical debt. And I think that's probably the most common mistake people make is they attribute technical debt to a property of the system or a property of the code as opposed to an emergent property of the organizational context in which the code was written. So having to rush through a feature to land a client is going to generate technical debt. But you know what else will? Having so much time in the world that you can invest like three months in building out some fancy core OS based Docker system, which I have been on teams that have done that. And that has also been technical debt because now they have this carry cost that just doesn't provide any value. In what ways have you seen like technical debt that you've been exposed to impact the work and slow you down? And how did you work through that? I personally don't believe in technical debt as a concept. I think the system is the way the system is because that is how it had to be. Like, have you heard of the retrospective prime directive? No. So the retrospective prime directive is a, a guideline for software retrospectives or really any kind, which basically says that we all believe that the people who are in this room together are doing the best they can with the time, resources, skills, et cetera, that they have. And it's just kind of like this acknowledgement that like, no one here is filled with malice. No one here is trying to sabotage us. We're all trying the best we can. I think when we use technical debt as kind of an argument for not doing things or doing something else, it really pulls away from that acceptance of who someone is and where they are and what caused them to behave in this way. That's kind of 
where I kind of fall on there. I, it's not like, yeah, sometimes I have to go slower because, you know, there's too much coupling between this and that, or someone's got too much logic and active record callbacks, or, you know, they've shifted half of the code to React and the other half's in jQuery. Like, all of those things happen. It's life. We've all been there. Sometimes that slows you down, but it's not important that it slows you down. It's important that you acknowledge where it came from, you acknowledge where it is, and you take a little step to make it a little bit better in the moment. All right. Let's take a moment to talk a little bit about your tech worker cooperative. Firstly, what services does Cohere offer? Yeah, so Cohere mostly focuses on, we we basically do pairing executive coaching. So my business partner, Jennifer, she works with a couple different vice presidents in the Bay Area and kind of around the nation at this point and helps them navigate some of the, hey, I'm a manager and I've never managed before kind of stuff. Like management is a job and we should, when we treat it like that, we do better work, right? If we just treat it like a, you know, authority gathering system, then it becomes less helpful. We're like, hey, we're trying to hire and we're trying to go from 20 to 40 people over the next six months. How do we do that without making everything really suck for everyone? Or how do we do that without sabotaging our business objectives? Like we've we've got to release this thing while we also have to increase our headcount so that we can actually maintain the stuff we've already built. And like, how do you navigate all of those complexities? That's kind of what Jennifer does. And then what I do is I mostly do the opposite of that, which is pair with people, facilitate mob programming sessions. And we just kind of like take stuff as it comes. You know, sometimes we need to add some tests. Sometimes we need to delete some. Sometimes we need to spend some time fixing bugs. Sometimes we need to spend some time shipping features. And we just kind of like work on software together, but try and bring a really deep mindfulness to it. So it's not just a helter skelter kind of approach to software, or just not just chasing the latest fancy technology or whatnot. Why a cooperative, out of curiosity? When we founded Cohere, there was three of us. I don't know if you know Betsy Habel. So she's Betsy the Muffin on Twitter, but she was uh, the third member there. And we basically were like, well, we want to make sure that we are participating in a democratic manner and one where power dynamics are clear and explicit as opposed to implicit. And so we structured ourselves as a three-person cooperative organization, essentially, so that we would each have a single vote regardless of how much vesting happens. So like Betsy's currently working with the long-term stock exchange, Eric Reese's company. um, And that was just a really good opportunity for her. So she still has a vote within our organization because she contributed over the last couple of years, right? And we still appreciate her guidance. And because we've structured as a cooperative, she still has the same voice as myself or Jennifer, which is really useful from a, oh crap, how do we decide X or Y or Z, even though she's vesting at a slower period because of, She's just not contributing as much time as Jennifer and I are at this time. Interesting. Yeah. I remember there was the, back in my anarcho days, I was always curious about co-ops and things like that. And now that I moved off into the system, I suppose, of running an LLC with a business partner and had a previous business partner, I understand the whole voting dynamic there and stuff, how important that stuff can be, regardless of whether or not I have a majority percentage of ownership or something. So also, I think you're also part of another co-op called Zinc. What is that organization and how does that distinguish from Cohere? Yeah. So I'm going to try and avoid being too wide-eyed and fanatical here. Uh, <laughs> but I I believe that most of the ills that we are experiencing in society at this moment are caused by authority being stripped away from people who are doing the work and ownership of the work product being extracted basically from the people doing the work into basically two shareholders and only shareholders, right? So if you look at the percentage of GDP that is distributed to labor versus to capital holders, it is basically half of what it was in 1970 and close to like 30% of what it was in 1930s and 1920s. So back when we had our first like real big economic movement towards like labor unions and stuff, we were capturing about 60-ish percent of the and this, please don't quote me on these numbers because I'm, I don't have my references in front of me. Uh, but we were capturing about 60% of the GDP was going towards workers and less so for the capital providers, like the people who aren't necessarily working. And technology and software in particular is a really interesting thing where if I wanted to write a product or build an app, like all it takes is time and attention and effort, right? It doesn't require a significant capital investment to buy a tractor, right? We don't have to buy a mill to like start building software. Like we can just like sit down and type it, type and go to glitch.io or whatever their new domain name is and throw up some express web app and it just, it exists. 
And so the zinc kind of came out of this notion that, well, what if we could, instead of instead of going to the VCs and being like, hey, we would like to get a quarter million dollars to spend a year of time to build software that we think might work. What if we just start building things in our spare time as or as much as we can provide and put it into the collective pot? So like technically we all own the code. So it's not just my open source project or your closed source project. It's like it's our code. What if we push things forward a little bit every day or every week, because we don't really have enough time and attention to put into daily improvements and, you know, distribute the profits according to the people who contributed over the last quarter or so. And so we've got a few different products. They're not great. They're basically, I've worked with a few different people who like had stuff and they're like, Hey, can you take this over for us? So we've got like some photo products that we have that we just bought from somebody who was like, hey, they put in like a couple million into this developing these things and we were able to pick them up for a song because they just weren't making enough money. And then I've got a couple other people who have software services that just, they can't afford to hire people full time and it doesn't make sense, but they're really good designers and really good at connecting to the community. And so we just maintain their software for them and take a percentage of the revenue that it generates. Then distribute it based upon like how much time and attention did you put in? The goal is to get to a spot where instead of all the cash going into, you know, back out to the early investors or the CEO who exits, right? We have Travis Kalikanak or whatever jumping out of Uber and now going to start this new thing where it's probably going to be terrible as well and bad for everyone. And just like put it back into the people who are actually contributing the time and attention to building the software. And I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. It might be dead in a year. Who the fuck knows? But like... It's kind of nice to just be able to sit down with people and like solve a problem, ship a feature and know that like maybe it's only going to it took me two hours and maybe I make 50 fucking cents for that two hours of work. But it's my work and that's how much value was created. And I'm going to get that back as opposed to my income being on loan from somebody who's like, and if you don't make this exit for $10 million, then why the fuck did I even hire you kind of dealio? All right. Thanks for sharing some background on that. I was quite curious when I was doing a bit of research on you. We'll be back with my interview with Z in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I want to thank you for listening to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these conversations remotely valuable, please consider sharing it amongst your peers on social media like LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or what have you. Also, please consider writing a review on Alpha Podcasts or any other location on the internet where people apparently might write nicer, maybe even critical things about podcasts. Honest feedback is always appreciated. Thanks again. And now back to my interview with Z Spencer. As you reflect on your experience in the industry, do you often find yourself more on team rewrite or team refactor? I'm on team add incremental value and make slight improvements as you go because rewriting software, I will do Indiana Jones refactors where I'm like, okay, I've got this feature and it mostly works and I can rewrite a baseline implementation in an afternoon. So we're just going to rewrite the baseline and then swoop, ta-da, like, oh no, let's hope there's no giant rocks that come after us. But the vast majority of the time it is, if I can't ship an improvement in an afternoon, then I took too big of a step and I really just need to make a smaller step. It's interesting. You're kind of like using like time boxing and it sounded like a little bit based off the way you're describing your work. And like on Wednesdays, I work with so-and-so. Does having that sort of constraint produce different sort of developer habits, I think, in some ways versus if you're working on it every day of the week on the same app? I think it has an impact. Because if I'm only going to spend six hours on this product in a given week, then I can't really design the system in such a way that it would allow me to take more, like to spend more time on that, right? Like if my constraint is when I managed my first team, I would go around and kind of jokingly say a feature a week makes the future less bleak because like we had literally not shipped anything in a year. And so like we basically pivoted to a, what could we do so that we could actually deliver a single small improvement every week? We can still have other work streams for the bigger stuff, but like one single small improvement every week. And that's just kind of like the change in that organization just like really stuck with me. Like the fact that the CEO actually liked the engineers 
after that <laughs> was huge. And so I've kind of like brought that mentality to all of my work. It's like, okay, if I can't show my work at the end of the day and be to someone who doesn't know how to, you know, T-Rex arms at a computer until it does what they want it to, then I'm probably just, I've designed the system poorly. When do you think it's appropriate for a team to really take a serious consideration to rewrite? If they don't have any users and they don't have any time constraints, I think there's a lot of value in taking what you've learned when implementing a thing, whether it is a a specific feature or a specific problem or protocol or whatever, and trying to make a version two, right? Take what you've learned and make a new one. And so if you're in a spot where you literally can cut off all of the existing users and be content with that, then I think it's totally reasonable to rewrite. I actually, we we did a rewrite last year. One of our clients, they had this ASP.NET thing that they literally run inside of a, like a Windows box on the cloud somewhere. And all their other stuff was in Rails and small organization, bootstrapped organization. And they're like, well, it makes us money, but not a lot of money. And it costs us a lot of time. And we'd really like to take what we learned with our existing customers on it and just make a brand new version. But like the business made that decision. It wasn't me. I didn't say like, oh, we should make a new one. I was like, well, what can we do to refactor this next time? They're like, you know what? It just doesn't really meet our customer needs. Like it was a 15 year old app and it's not really what makes sense anymore. And so we were able to strip it down to its bare bones and re-implement it by doing a rewrite. And that worked out really well because it was it was driven not by technical pain, but by customer pain. And that, I think, was the best mechanism I've seen for a rewrite. Right. We're usually rarely ever advocating for team rewrite. My company, we're an agency. Recently, we had a company come to us who, weird story, they came to us with, hey, we want to work on this project. We need a Ruby on Rails team. That's what we specialize in here. And they own a bunch of different applications. And then when we got into it, we're looking at the code. We're like, this is actually a PHP application. And they're like, oh, yeah, nobody's worked on it in several years. And it's kind of a mess anyways. Why don't we just rewrite it in Ruby on Rails? Because we have a bunch of other apps that are with Rails. And this is get everything more in line. And we're like, whoa, 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 hold on there. That sounds great because we'll get, we still get the project and now it's a bigger project, I guess. But what about the people that are using it? And like, what's that experience going to look like? And how do we migrate? And like the people that are our clients, they weren't even around when the application was developed. So like nobody has like a clear list of like what everything this application does. And like, there's like, what do we think it does this? It's an interesting process. So we're in the process of rewriting a PHP application that nobody really knows entirely how it works, except for when you look at the code and you try to like piece it together. So at least there's a clear enough goalpost that we're working towards, but I'm curious to see how this works out. So for the audience, uh, I will, I'll try to keep some tabs on that. I am not team at rewrite like ever, and we're doing that one right now. But again, the business said, let's do this. This makes more sense. And okay, we're going for it. So you want to hear a really fun rewrite story? It wasn't fun living through it, but it's fun now in hindsight. So one of my first consulting gigs was with a pizzeria, which you may have heard of, called Domino's. They're based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. It's a lovely state. And they had somehow managed to launch their first e-commerce solution while retaining none of the ownership for the source code. And they had put it on a platform, a cloud platform, a very early cloud platform, that got acquired by Microsoft. And then Microsoft shut down the cloud platform. And so they had no legal right to the source code and they had no computers that they could run the code on. And this powered all of their e-commerce stuff. And this was like right before like mobile was starting to be a thing. And like, you know, people are used to buying like stuff online. So what they did is they hired, I think it was close to 30 developers. And we rewrote from the ground up without changing any of the user interface that we could into code that they could own and deploy to their own IT infrastructure. And it was this, it was like a, geez, a year and a half long project. And when it launched, the revenue per user went up because we had written it in such a way that it was slightly higher performance. And so users went through the funnel more. And so the user throughput increased. And so their revenue from e-commerce went up and everyone was super excited because like we rewrote this application. I've, I've never experienced a rewrite that actually made a company more money, except for in this one case very early in my career. And I've never seen it again. Oh, wow. That's great. 
I have a couple of last questions for you. And this one's kind of like somewhat hypothetical scenario. Let's assume that there's at least, I hope, one listener out there, it's a developer, who is about to embark on writing a new application for one of their new clients and are debating their software framework options. They find themselves debating between using a framework that they've been using for the last several years with good success, but are really curious about this new technology that they've been hearing about and been looking for an opportunity to try it out. What advice might you offer them on how to navigate that decision? Again, it all goes back to your constraints. My personal belief system is if someone is paying me to do something for them, I should be doing it to the best of my ability. And that often means that I will choose the language or framework that I am most skillful at, right? So I can most easily convert from the desires in my customer's heart to working software, right? Because that is the way that you build trust is you understand your customer's desires, you type some stuff at them, and then they like you and trust you. Um, however, that can be very, very sad because you just get shoehorned into a particular technology stack because, well, you know Rails, so you're just going to build Rails apps, right? So if you can negotiate a lower rate or if you can do something that allows you to share in the economic cost of exploring this new technology or this new library or framework, then I think it's reasonable to to go in that direction. But ultimately, the decision in my mind is always about how can I solve the pain point in the way that is most short and long-term economically viable for the customer? New technologies are almost never they go through what I call, you know, adolescence, like the terrible twos, and then they get to adolescence, and then they get to puberty, and then they're like teenagers, right? And it just being aware of where that stack is in this aging process, I think is also useful. So if you're building something and it's in Express, I think Express is pretty stable at this point. I would not be averse to like building a product in like a web app in Express, so long as it made a lot of sense from other reasons. I think Rails has really hit this maturity that is just really nice. Like it's convenient, it works, it's significantly less surprising than it was two years ago. You're not getting new gems released every couple months. It's just stable, which is delightful. But yeah, that's kind of the the mental model. Like all the different things that would pop into my head if I were trying to evaluate that kind of decision. All right. It's something that I've I ruminated a lot over the years because it's kind of early on in the Rails community. And like at some point, I used to have to have conversations about why Rails versus something else. And that conversation went away at some point. And it wasn't like, well, I wasn't talking, arguing with people or debating with like Java developers back like it used to be many years ago. But now it's almost like, but why are you still using Rails? It's been around for so long. Like almost like maturity ends up being like a bad thing. And it makes me question like how... I might have dismissed some other technologies in the past, maybe for similar reasons. Or I think there's an aspect to developers, you know, like looking at their resume and thinking like, well, how am I still going to be valuable in five years if I don't get a chance to work with these other technologies? And am I going to become stagnant? It's a challenging thing, I think, for people to navigate their own personal best interests with the business's best interests. I don't envy those decisions, but I, I think I side a little bit more with you thinking that like you should do what... How can you get something out the door that shows value? And this isn't necessarily an opportunity to tinker on someone else's dime. But on the other end of that, thanks to a bunch of people that did that once upon a time with Ruby on Rails, I now have a successful business to some degree of inheriting a lot of applications that other developers, for some reason, decided to use Ruby on Rails to build their application. You know, Then they found us to help take over that project at some point. So keep some of us in business and that's good. It's an, it's an interesting, I think, challenge for folks to navigate. There's also like other parts of the economic trade-off are things like where does the data live and who owns it, right? So if you're building a thing where that data should not be on the cloud, for instance, then Rails is a really bad implementation link framework for that, right? Because it's, you know, active, like active record really wants to store on either PostgreSQL or Mongo or something, right? So if you're like, building some kind of personal health tracker, you might want to look into native applications for that instead, right? I could I could go for hours about just like how we optimize our decision making when building software, not for the customer and the user, but for us as programmers and how when we do that, we wind up creating or encouraging systems to be sometimes user hostile. You wind up with software that doesn't actually meet people's needs because 
we spend all of our time implementing a new mechanism for doing database transactions when really we're not selling a database transaction system. We are selling a product that does this for a particular customer. And if you want to sell a database transaction system, I would encourage you to look at, you know, working for Red Hat or popping to a place that does focus on that kind of infrastructure. Well, with that, I have a few last questions. So what non-programming book do you find yourself most often recommending to people in our industry? Does design count as non-programming? Definitely. Indy Young wrote a book called Mental Models back in, I want to say 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. The things that really stood out to me from that book are how to attempt to deeply empathize with a variety of people who all want similar things. So that's one that I really like to encourage programmers to read because programmers, like the secret ingredient to successful software is empathy, right? Like, in my opinion. And software is just a tool for facilitating relationships between people and data at this point. And then the other one that I encourage is one called Observing the User Experience, which I think we're probably at the fifth or something, sixth edition. But it provides, it's like this tome, it's a thousand pages and maybe more. And it just provides a bunch of different ways that you can perform rigorous user research. I would not encourage people to use it and then immediately apply it as written because it is for professional user experience researchers or user researchers. But the mental models that underlie it and the practices and principles behind it are mind-blowing. And it's not just like, oh, you should look at what people are doing. It's like, Here's how you should phrase your questions so that you create space for people to behave as opposed to, you know, do the thing that they think you want them to. Observing the user experience. I'll leave the links to those two books in the show notes. And where can listeners best follow you and your thoughts on software development online? I don't really talk about software development online very much anymore. It was kind of like a surprise that someone actually wanted to talk to me about this because mostly I talk about things like economics and organizational dynamics and all of that stuff. But if you go to Twitter and look for Z-S-P-E-N-C-E-R, Z Spencer, no E's in there. Well, the E's are in my last name, not in my first. That is probably where you'll get my unfiltered feed. Just keep in mind, it's not going to make you happy. You're not going to learn how to program from it. You might get very sad because I tend to mire in the horribleness of the society we have developed for ourselves as opposed to the utopia we could be heading towards. But that's, you know, such is life. One step at a time. Well, it's been such a delight having you on Maintainable Z. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Robbie.